It is five o'clock our time. We want to take this opportunity to welcome all those who are here to worship God this evening and welcome those online who may be listening and watching. In just a moment, Brother Steve Jones will direct us in our worship and song. At this time, we will go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that we as your children may call upon you as our Father anytime we need to. But especially in this worship assembly, we we come before you together. We give praise to your name. We give you thanks for your goodness and your mercy, your benevolence. Thank you for your word that gives us the pathway that we should walk on this earth so we can be prepared when we leave this world to come and be in your presence. We thank you for being in our presence this evening in worship. Be with Brother Steve as he directs our worship in song. Be with us as participants. Be with me in a few moments as I present your word from your servant Micah. We pray for those who are sick, especially those who are really struggling and having a hard way to go. And we pray that they will not lose heart spiritually, even though they may be <coughs> sick physically, that they will lean on you as their God and their sustainer. We pray that you be with their caregivers also. And let them not be discouraged knowing that it's sometimes hard to care for those who are very ill. We pray for those who are among our number that are not here for other reasons. If there are any who are not assembling, whether it be with this congregation here or other places, because they've allowed sin to take over their lives, we pray that something may be said or done to cause them to examine their heart before you and repent and return before it's everlasting too late. We pray for those who may not be your children that something may be said by a faithful servant of yours to share the gospel with them, that they may hear, believe, understand, and obey. We pray that you help us to live as faithfully as we can in a culture that really despises righteousness. May we live righteous lives. Forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name, amen. Number 761. All three verses, 761. <clears throat> Sweet are the promises, kind is the word, dearer far than any message man ever heard. Pure was the mind of Christ, sinless I see. He the great example is in heaven for me. Trust. 
upon the Savior, and thy soul is secure. Where he leads, I'll follow, follow all the way. Where he leads, I'll follow, follow Jesus every day. Amen. 773. Soft as the voice of an angel, breathing a lesson unheard. Oh, with a gentle persuasion, whispers a comforting word. Wait till the darkness is over. Oh. 
be our song of invitation, 762. After singing that song, I almost wish my lesson were about Jesus. In a sense, it ends up being that way when you get to the end of our study this evening on the prophet Micah. Micah's name means who is like Jehovah. In our more modern translations, it would say who is like the Lord. What about Micah, the man? What about this man that we see in the Old Testament by the name of Micah? One of the things we know that's not on the screen is that he was a younger contemporary of the prophet Isaiah. He also lived somewhere around the time of the prophet <coughs> Jeremiah. His home was in a place called Morasheth. The time of Micah is given in the first verse of this Old Testament prophet or prophecy, which, which says that the time was during the days of Jotham, who, who reigned from 750 to 735 B.C. These are not birth dates. These are reigning dates. Ahaz, who reigned from 735 to 715 B.C., and Hezekiah, who reigned from 715 to 786 B.C. BC, who were kings of Judah. Upon reading this prophecy, you get the idea maybe at first that he's writing primarily to the northern kingdom, but if you read, read all of it, you'll come to learn that the audience was both the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel. And we'll see some passages that help us with that. For example, we see judgment against both Israel and Judah. In chapter 1 and verses 6 and 7, where God has the word of the Lord that you see in verse 1, it's coming through Micah, says, I will make Samaria a heap of ruins in the open country, planting places for a vineyard. I will pour her stones down into the valley, and I will lay bare her foundations, all of her idols will be smashed, all of her earnings will be burned with fire, and all of her images I will make desolate. For she collected them from a harlot's earnings, and to the earnings of a harlot they will return. You may recall that the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom became separate during the time after Solomon had died, when Rehoboam served as the king of the southern kingdom and Jeroboam began to serve and reign over the northern kingdom and Samaria is a is a word that represents the northern kingdom Jerusalem or Judah represent the southern kingdom at times when you look at those particular words now what was God's desire God's desire and always his desire from these prophets is that these people would change, that they would repent of what they were doing because God was, he, God was not happy, but he wanted them to make changes. He did not want to see them destroyed. He didn't create the nation for it to be destroyed. He created it to be a serving people to him, but often, as you know, they did not do that, and they got into more trouble as the years progressed. What about the conquerings of these nations? Somewhere around 722 B.C., Sennacherib of Assyria conquered Samaria, or the northern kingdom. And then Nebuchadnezzar later conquered Judah and Jerusalem in 597 B.C. It helps us to remember that, that when you read dates in B.C., the higher number goes back. And so if it's a low number, then it's closer to like the time of Christ. And so... During, so somewhere not too long after this was written, the northern kingdom was punished. But God also warned the southern kingdom because they were getting involved in some of the same sins as the northern kingdom. Micah, the prophecies. I want to share a few minutes tonight of some highlight prophecies that, that I'll put on the screen. And let's look at some of the things that were said. We have seven chapters 
in Micah, we are only going to look at some key verses from those chapters. The first one says, Micah chapter uh, 1 and verse 2, Hear, O peoples, all of you, <coughs> hear. Listen, O earth, and all it contains. And let the Lord God be a witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. Now, if I'm going to be charged with something and I'm going to have a witness against me, in one sense, I want it to be God because I know it will be true. On another sense, I don't want it to be God because it's going to be true. He's, he's a witness not for the defense. He's a witness against them. And we have to remember that this also gives us the idea that God knows what's going on and he is qualified, fully qualified, to speak to the situation. And this will come up again as you get later into the book about him being a witness against them. He also speaks from his holy temple. Now, Micah chapter 1 and verse 3 says, For behold, the Lord is coming forth from his place. He will come down and tread on the high places of the earth. When high places are spoken of with regard to the northern kingdom, it was talking about high places of false sacrifice and false worship. But we'll also notice as we progress that Judah was guilty of the same things as the northern kingdom. But God's coming down and he's going to tread on these places. How is he going to do that? He will use these evil nations to punish his people. It's God that's behind these acts. Notice Micah chapter 1 and verse 5. All of this is for the rebellion of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. What is the rebellion of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? And you recall that Samaria was established falsely by Jeroboam, and, and no one caused the son of Nebat, no one caused Israel to sin more than Jeroboam did. And so it's, but, it went, but sin is rebellion against God. It's rebellion against his will. And, and, but you notice that it, there are many sins. It is the sins of the house of Israel. And this is, what is the high place of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? And there's an accusation being made by God that there's some form of idolatry taking place also in Jerusalem. Were they influenced by the northern kingdom? Possibly so. The northern kingdom was worse about it. And obviously the influence was there, them being neighbors, and of course, neighbors of the heathen nations around them. Chapter 2 and verse 1. There is something going on with these people. How do these things come about that they do evil? Woe to those who scheme iniquity. They scheme these things and they work out evil on their beds. So at night they're thinking about these things and maybe they wake up in the middle of the night or maybe they wake up early in the morning but they're lying in the bed thinking about what evil they're going to do and when the morning comes, they do it. They plan on it. For it is in the power of their hands. I read that and I think God does not control our actions. He doesn't control our thinking unless we allow his word to control our thinking. But God does not manipulate. And so what are they doing? They're scheming. They're doing it on their beds. And then the next verse says, what do they do? They covet fields. Wasn't it against the law of God under the Ten Commandments for them to covet anything that is your neighbor's? They're violating God's will. They are not, and they seize them. They don't just covet them. They're taking other people's property. They're taking their houses. And they're taking them away. They rob a man in his house, a man in his inheritance. Here's a person who's worked all of his life to get where he is so when he gets older and he can pass on his inheritance to his children and they leave him with nothing. That's about as heartless as you can be when it comes to dealing with people. That certainly violated the law of God, did it not? And then the next thing we see in verse 3, therefore, therefore, God's going to speak. I'm bearing witness against you. Behold, I'm planning against this family a calamity. 
from which you cannot remove your necks. And now that's a figure of speech from saying you're going to be captured and you're not going to be able to do anything about it. And we know that in 722 that Sennacherib and the Assyrians began to attack the northern kingdom and took them captive. And you're not going to get it, you're not going to get out of this. And it's implied that they're haughty, that they're arrogant, and you will not walk haughtily. And you're not, going to, you're not going to enjoy this. It will be an evil time. This is going to be very difficult on you. Now pause for a moment and remember God is saying these things hoping that they would change. Now, so he's warning them. You know, hard preaching should never be for the purpose of the preacher gratifying himself because he preached a hard sermon, but because he cares about people who are going in the wrong direction. It always should be motivated by love for the people. But then the people, what do they say? Do not speak. We don't want to hear it. So they speak out. But if they do not speak out concerning these things, reproaches will not be turned back. If those who are speaking for God, if they don't say something, you're not going to change. Isn't it marvelous how God wants them to change? But they say, we don't, don't speak. I have had the experience as a preacher at times. People meet me at the back door and, and, and because they would get upset at something I said and I try to remind them I did not say that. They say, yes, you did. I say, no, I just said what God said. And that's what you have to do. Preach the word. But sometimes people don't want to hear that. And so they said, don't speak. Micah chapter 2 and verse 11. Here's an interesting passage that speaks against these people. If a man walking after wind and falsehood had told lies and said, I will speak out to you concerning wine and liquor, he would be a spokesman to this people. In other words, if, you, if somebody comes along and talks about evil things, he, that'd be fine. But he told these other preachers, and evidently Micah, don't speak. But he said, listen, this is the kind of person that you listen to. These people have become ungodly to the point that they don't want to listen to God and they would listen to those who would tell them things, make them feel better. But God says something, Micah 2 and verse 12, I will surely assemble all of you, Jacob. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. This is a prophecy. I believe that, first of all, there would be a remnant of people who would come out of Samaria and ultimately become Christians one day. And also the people in Judah would survive the Babylonian captivity, that God maintained a remnant of people. Now the Lord came through the southern kingdom people, through Judah. But there would be a remnant that would ultimately, but it's really a spiritual remnant because all the people who lived then would die before Jesus would come. But when you read about a remnant, you're talking about God's people ultimately in the church and in the kingdom. Now, Micah 3 and verse 1. And I said, Hear now, heads of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know justice? I want you to notice there are a couple places in here where he speaks to the rulers or the leaders of the people. Here now, heads of Jacob, the people who lead the people have the greatest weight of responsibility of making sure people hear and know what God wants. It's up to them to recognize if things are going the wrong way. There's nothing worse than for an eldership to ignore sin. There's nothing worse than for a preacher to act like there's no sin in the congregation because they're afraid something somebody's going to get upset with what they've said. But he speaks to the heads, the leaders of the people. The heads of the people could be the heads of the tribes, could also be the heads of the homes, but also other leaders within the, 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 the spiritual leadership of the children of Israel. But the question is, is it not for you to know what's right and what's wrong? Aren't you the ones who should know? It's Micah 3 and verse 2. But what kind of people are you? You hate good and you love evil. You hate it. And, you, and here's what ultimately happens. When people hate good, 
and they love evil, they do atrocious things to other people. And, and, and some, there are some people who put some videos up on Facebook and, and they're little clips of what I call violent movies where someone's challenged and they end up in some kind of fist fight and, and they give credit to the person who can, can win the physical battle there. Somebody that knows karate or is good with a gun or whatever, or you know, and they kind of give credit, but some people thrive on violence. They like to watch violence on violent movies and they want to see the violence from real life activities where the police have to get involved. Violence is a very real thing. You tear off the skin from people and the flesh from their bones and, and also, he goes on to say that, that, that you cut them in pieces. That's a horrible thing that they're doing to other people. This is not simple disregard. It is a violent attack. Now turn with me into chapter 3 and let's look together at verses 9 through 12. And here we come to the heads of Jacob again. Speaking of the leadership. God says through his servant Micah, now hear this, heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel who abhor justice and twist everything that is straight. And I think they don't, they don't like justice. They're not concerned with fairness. They're concerned with what will please them, what they can accomplish. And so you need to listen the rulers of the house of Israel who abhor justice and twist everything that is straight. And you take what is right and you turn it into something evil. Who build Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with violent injustice. It's more than just a turning away from God. It's turning to the violent lives of the people around them just like the violence of the pagan people around them. And what do they do? Her leaders pronounced judgment for a bride. And Elisa and I, when well, she was reading a book to me recently about the, the crime people, the mafia people some years ago, and how people, you'd be surprised in government that would take a bribe. You wanna know how some things happen that we think are just out of this world, that it's unbelievable if they would happen? It's money under the table. Somebody's taking a bribe. And they don't care what happens. All they care about is the money. Same thing here. And her leaders pronounce judgment for a bribe. We'll, I, you know, I'll say whatever you want me to say. If I get enough money. Now watch this. Her priest instruct for a prize. The priest's job was to teach the law of God. When they weren't making sacrifices, they were teaching the law. That was a job of theirs. And so, well, we'll just say whatever you want us to if you give us enough money. Judah started a long time before Judas did, didn't he? The idea. And her prophets divine for money. Yet they, and what's so interesting, and so you think about the sins of the leadership. And here's what's interesting. There are people just like this today. They, yet they lean on the Lord saying, is, he not, is not the Lord in our midst? People who do evil, I mean, do evil for money, and say, but you know, well, God's on our side. We're, we're servants of God. That's a lie. It's a bald-faced lie. But that's what they're saying. People can, can convince themselves, or they say it for the sake of the people. This is what God wants us to do. You have to put it in perspective of the situation. And then calamity will not come on us. In other words, you know what these things that Mike is saying, that, that's not going to happen. <coughs> and you know, they really didn't care whether it did or not. They might not live long enough to see it. But they said, it's not going to happen. Now, I want you to notice what God says through Mike in verse 12. Therefore, on account of you, who? The, the heads of the, the, of the nations. On account of you, because you have been evil, you have not only allowed evil, you have participated in evil. 
Zion will be plowed as a field. Jerusalem will become a heap of ruins and the mountain of the temple will become high places of a forest. And ultimately, Sennacherib did come in 722 B.C. In 587 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar came and they did exactly what God said they would do. But it was the leadership. And it's caused, and, it, and so they're responsible. Micah chapter 4 and verse 1 is a shift of gears, a shift of ideas. Micah moves to the last days. And he says, it will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills and the peoples will stream into it. When? When's this going to happen? in the last days and what's going to happen well the mountain of the house of the lord is coming and it will be established in the chief of the mountains where now these are figures of speech that gives high elevation spiritually speaking high prominence to the house of the lord we know according to first uh, timothy 3 and verse 15 that when paul spoke to Young Timothy talked to him about how he should behave himself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. Ultimately, this is a prophecy of the Lord's church. It's very similar to what Isaiah wrote in Isaiah chapter 2. That tells us to some degree that Micah and Isaiah were contemporaries. So Micah just says the same thing Isaiah does. And here's the thing. These bad things are going to happen. You people are rebelling against God. You're sinning and, and many sins and you're rebelling. One of these days God's going to do something. And I've tried to figure out how you tie those things together. If you'll do what God says, something better will come. Oh, it's going to come whether they did or not. But it would benefit them. And also, the northern kingdom did not have to go into captivity. That's why Micah, and he's not the only one. There were other prophets that spoke to them. Isaiah did. Judah didn't have to suffer under the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. But one of these days, God's going to establish something. And it will be raised above the hills. And all peoples will stream or flow into it. This moves far beyond these years, moves to the first century when the Lord's church was established. Not only Jews, but also Gentiles would become members of the church. Wonderful prophecy. And so we, we look at a couple of, uh, of uh, other passages here, and, and I want you to think about verse 2 of Micah 4. It says, Many nations will come and say, These are the people who become members of the church from different nations. Not only nations of, among the Jewish people, but all nations of Gentiles in the world. Did not Paul go all over the then known world and establish congregations of the Lord's church made up of Jew and Gentile? Many nations will come and say, what are you talking about here? He's talking about evangelism in this era of Christianity. Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. And you compare Revelation 22, 17, and the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears come. And let him who thirsts, let him come and drink of the water of life freely. That's an invitation by the church to people to become members of the church. And to the house of the God of Jacob. Not only will you have that, you're going to have some, some teaching or some instruction involved in the church. And, and, and God's ways will be taught. This is in the last days. This is not this time. This is the last days. And that we may walk in his paths. For from Zion will go forth the law, even the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. You remember what Jesus said in John chapter 6 and verse 45. As it is written in the prophets, they shall all be taught of God. He who has, who has learned, heard and learned from the Father will come to me. The prophets, there, there are many prophets who wrote of these things. But what is the church? How did it get established? Well, it was established because Jesus died, but it also was established based upon teaching. 
go into all the world and preach the gospel to all nations, to many nations, to all people, and preach it to everyone. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. Mark 16, 15, and 16. In the Great Commission, when Jesus gave the Great Commission, in Matthew 28, 18, the Lord said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And then he says, You, you can go and make disciples of all the nations in the name of the Father, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now look at verse 20. Teaching them. What is this text teaching? That he may teach us about his ways. You Christians have heard the gospel by teaching, instruction, continue to be faithful by teaching, and teaching them to observe all things, Jesus said, that I said to you. In Acts 2.42, when the church was established, we learned that the church continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching. But, and to continue in something meant they started in it. The church would come as a teaching institution. Why? So that people would walk in his paths, to walk in the ways of God. And then the pronouncement of Zion going forth the law, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, knowing that the gospel was first preached from the city of Jerusalem in the first century. <clears throat> so preaching on Pentecost. And then you have something else from Micah that looks also into the future. There are, there, there are two prophecies uh, in, in here that have to do with one with the church, one here with Jesus. But as for you, Bethlehem, according to Matthew 2 and verse 6, Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. And as for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, there were two Bethlehems in ancient history, and one of them was Bethlehem. And to separate the two by the name was it Bethlehem Ephrathah. That was the one where Jesus was born. Too little to be among the clans of Judah, for from you one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. That's a prophecy of one who would come from Judah for which Jesus came, he would go forth for me, God says, for my purposes, Jesus did, and to be a ruler in Israel. Jesus is the head of the church. Jesus is king of kings and lord of lords. But how long? How long has this one existed? There are people that say that Christ was a created being. Not so. Colossians chapter 1 verse 18 says that all things were created through him. And so he, and all, through him all things came into being. If, it, if all things came into being, Jesus didn't make himself. He's always been. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. That eternal word that John talked about who became flesh in John chapter 1. This is no ordinary ruler. No ordinary king. He's an eternal king. He's always been. And in Micah chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, I want to talk to you people now. I've given you all these things, and there are many other things that Micah said that we didn't read this evening. But in Micah 6, 1 and 2, the prophet speaks for God, says, Hear now what the Lord is saying. First of all, God started out by saying, I'm going to be a witness against you. And he tells him all the things that are going on that are wrong that you're doing. He brings out very clear things of their evil behavior, the idolatry. He warned them of the calamities that would come unless they would change. Hear now what the Lord is saying. Arise. I'll tell you what you people do. You plead your case before the mountains and let the hills hear your voice. I don't know for certain if he's talking about those high places where they've been worshiping or not, but I can't help but wonder if that's not the implication. I tell you what, you, here's what you've been doing. You've been worshiping in these high places. You, you've started giving into the way of idolatry of the people around you. I tell you what, let them help you. Why don't you bring them down here and let's have a talk about it. Go, go talk to them about it. No, it was the idolatry that got them into trouble. How could they go to, the, to that for help? 
Listen, you mountains, to the indictment of the Lord and to you enduring foundations of the earth, because the Lord has a case against his people. Even with Israel, he will dispute. In other words, I'm, I'm letting you know this is not going to be tolerated. Now, God loves those people. Isn't it a shame that God loves people now and they treat him with the same contempt? But that doesn't stop us from preaching. It doesn't stop us from caring because there always will be one or five or ten that will listen while the majority will reject. Micah chapter 6 and verse 3. God asked them a question. What have I done to you? And how have I wearied you? It's like, what have, what have I done here? Have I hurt you? Have I done something against you in some way? Of course, it's a rhetorical question. The answer, obviously, is I'm not, God's not done anything to them. God's not wearied them. They've wearied themselves with their own behavior, but he says, answer me. There's a time when God says, look, I'm speaking. I want you to tell me. I want you to tell me why, why, why this is going on. Tell me what I've done. You know what the answer would be? Nothing. The honest answer you went, well, you haven't done anything but help us. And I'm not, well, I haven't wearied you, God says. And, and so we get down here to chapter 6 and verse 6. And the question is asked, well, what's the remedy for all of this? How do we fix this? Will I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? How can I do that? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings and yearling calves and can we fix it like that? And, and, and does the Lord delight in thousands of rams, in 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? You wonder if they didn't learn that from the nations around them who would make child sacrifice to their gods. Does God want people to worship. You remember the conversation between Samuel and Saul. And he came, he was sent to destroy the Amalekites and he came back with the king and animals for sacrifice and 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 the answer was look, God demands obedience over sacrifice. It does me no good to worship God, even if I worship the right way, if my line is not my life is not aligned with his will. It does no good to do that. God doesn't want my prayers. He doesn't want my singing. He doesn't want my preaching. He doesn't want my money, my giving. He doesn't want anything unless he has my heart. And that's what we'll look at. He has told you, old man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. But you see, it was a failure to do these things, these fundamental things that had led to their unfaithfulness in the first place. And so you've not been just. You've not shown loving kindness. You have not walked humbly with your God. You've walked in arrogance against your God. You have been unkind and hateful to people. You've been unfair. You've accepted bribes and all of these sinful things. And... Because they did, we see in verse 12 of chapter 3 that the nation's going to pay for it. You want to know why nations suffer? Because of evil leadership. Same thing's true in the church. If leadership goes awry. But you know, there's a point that he makes in chapter 7 and verse 2. And it's really one of the sadder statements in all of Micah when it comes to the people. The godly person has perished from the land. There aren't any godly people here. Now that, that doesn't mean that there aren't some, like Micah was a good man, and I'm sure there were some others, but in the broader picture, the, uh, the godly person has perished. There's no upright person among men. There's, there's nobody who's doing what's right. I know it's hyperbole, it's exaggeration, but it's not false exaggeration. Most of the people were this way. And all of them lie in wait for bloodshed. Each of them hunts the other with a net. They're capturing slaves. People to make slaves of them. And, and concerning evil, both hands do it well. 
You know, you ever heard the expression, the devil is alive and well? Well, we don't mean that as a compliment to old Satan, do we? But the point is, both hands, you're real good at doing these things. In both hands, it's like you, you're fully involved. The prince asks, also the judge for a bribe, and a great man <coughs> speaks the desire of his soul. In other words, whatever he feels, that's what he'll ask for. So they weave it together. It has caused people to come together in the practice of evil. It's not simply here and here and here. You want to know why that some of the evil goes on and not only in the United States of America, sometimes we kind of pity our country. It's all over the world. Evil rulers get together. They plan together. They scheme together. And the nations pay the price. Well, that's what's going on here. And so the best of them is like a briar, the most upright like a thorn hedge. The day when you post your watchman, your punishment will come. Then their confusion will occur. You know, this is the kind of people you are, but if you put all the watchmen out you want to, you're still going to be overtaken. You're going to pay, unless, of course, they repented. But I will bear with the indignate, bear the indignation of the Lord because I've sinned against him. Until he pleads my case and executes justice for me, he will bring me out to the light and I will see righteousness. This is what a person should be saying. This is the response that they should have. Because I've sinned, and he's plead, and if he'll plead my case, you know, if I'll do what's right, but then the enemy will see and shame and will cover her who said to me, where's the Lord your God? My eyes will look on her. At that time, she will be trampled down like mire in the streets. There will come a time when things will get better. And you have to read all of Micah and put it all together to see where this is coming from. There will be a time when things get better. Did the children of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah, recover from Babylonian captivity? Oh, yes, 70 years later. And I've mentioned it before, but it still is a valuable point. They were broken forever from idolatry. Never, ever again will you read of a Jew worshiping an idol from the time they left Babylonian captivity. God is effective in his discipline, and it works. Then you, then you come to a question. You get down toward the end of the book. Who is a God like you who pardons iniquity? and passes over the rebellious act of the remnant of his possession. Now, obviously, that would come about through people who were penitent, who, were, who, were, who would love, love kindness, do justice and kindness, and walk humbly with God. If people would have that disposition, they'd have the actions to go along with that disposition, then God will forgive. God wants to forgive. Don't you wish more people understood that in the Christian age? You see, he delights in unchanging love. God delights in, in showing kindness to people. Aren't you glad as a Christian when you sin and you have a penitent heart? Say, Father, I've done it again. I'm sorry. I know I did it again. And I know I know better, but I did it again. And I'm sorry and you're penitent, and then you ought to pray, God, help me to do better. Help me not do that. He'll forgive you. He'll forget about it. As we confess our sins, the Bible says in 1 John 1, verse 9, He is faithful and just and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Micah 7, 19, He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. Yes, you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Now that is probably one of the more beautiful passages in all the Old Testament, that God wants to do this. He, he loves kindness. He loves to forgive. He, he wants to. Don't you wish that people wanted what God wanted for them, that they want to live right? I want to share something with you as we kind of wrap up this study this evening. Turn with me to Romans, the third chapter, beginning with verse 21. 
where Paul says some things about the law and it's a, in, in Romans is about the obedience of faith, Romans 1 and verse 5. But Paul says in Romans 3, begin with verse 21, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Micah's one of those prophets. Isaiah was one of those prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there's no distinction. Belief is the foundation. It's the fundamental thing that comes from a person for them to begin to walk with God. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Being justified as a gift by his grace through faith, through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God he passed over the sins previously committed. That's Micah 7, 19, fulfilled. There'll come a time when I will cast, I will tread your iniquities underfoot and I will cast their sins in the depths of the sea. Micah speaks for God and what he would do. The idea is when sins are cast to the depths of the sea, that's, that's, that's a figure that represents they're gone. They're, they've been removed. And he passes over sins previously committed. For the demonstration, verse 26, Romans 3, for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. How would God ultimately cast sins to the depths of the sea? Jesus came and Paul made it clear that it was through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus that we get forgiveness, that we're justified, verse 24. And, and he was, this is the thing that God displayed publicly. Jesus was out in view for everyone to see. And he was a propitiation. That word propitiation is a word for sacrifice, but it means that it, it pleased God. It, it appeased him. It took care of of, of the problem of sin. Who did? Jesus did that. Aren't you glad? As horrible as it was, and as embarrassing as it must have been to be, be publicly displayed as he was as a common criminal, but that's love that's on that cross. That's the blood of Jesus on that cross. That's the grace of God on that cross that's offered to people who have faith in him. Now there's more to it than faith. A person must be willing to repent. That's what God wanted these people to do. And that's what Jesus would teach in Luke 13, three, unless you repent, you'll perish. He said that to the Jews, you have to believe that I am he in John eight and verse 24, you'll die in your sins. He didn't want that, but that's what will happen if people don't accept Jesus as their Lord and their savior. What else do you need to do? You need to confess him. as Confess him before men. In Matthew 10, 32 and 33, he says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father who is in heaven. If you deny me, I will also deny you before my Father who is in heaven. I believe the first application had to do with the preaching of the gospel, but it also played on the recipients of the word who confessed it. The eunuch confessed it in Acts chapter 8 and verse 37. And after that eunuch confessed that, after he was talking, uh, Philip was teaching him from Isaiah, and then he taught Jesus from that text. And it's interesting, they came along the road as they were riding in this eunuch's chariot. He was the treasurer of Queen Candace of Ethiopia. He come to Jerusalem to worship, had his own copy of Isaiah. So who, who's the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? And from that very scripture, Philip preached Jesus to him. And they were going down the road in this chariot, and, and he asked an interesting question. <clears throat> what hinders me from being baptized? I thought he preached Jesus to him. Oh, he did. You can't preach Jesus without baptism. I don't care who you are. Philip did. 
And the, Phil, the eunuch wanted to know, what well, hinders me from being baptized? And Philip said, well, if you believe with all your heart, you, you may, you can do that. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And Philip and the eunuch went down into water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he immersed him. Isn't it interesting that the eunuch came up out of that water rejoicing? Why was he so happy? Because his sins had been cast into the depths of the sea. Jesus had paid the price for sin. And he got his sins washed away by Jesus' blood. The water doesn't do it, but obedience requires water and baptism. But it's because of the death of Jesus that makes baptism valid. Read Romans 6. It's all about what Jesus did, but we have to do that as well. Faith will carry us to do whatever the Lord asks us to do. But then I read Micah and I think, the Lord talking to me in any way in that prophecy, there's something I need to ch change about my life to be more aligned with the will of God. I don't want God to have, be a witness against me. I want him to be on my side. And the only way that that can be is if I do what he asks me to do. If you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, it's yours now as we stand and as we sing. Who at the door is standing, patiently drawing near, entrance within demanding, whose is the voice I hear? Sweetly the tones are calling, open the door for me. Supper is still prepared today. If you didn't have an opportunity this morning, this morning we read from the book of Mark for our Lord's Supper scriptural reference. I'll read it again for us from Mark 14, and we'll start at verse 22. And as they were eating, Jesus he took bread, he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to them, and he said, "Take, eat. This is my body." Then he took the cup when he had given thanks. He gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Assuredly, I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we would ask a blessing upon this bread. This bread represents the body of your son who willingly came to earth and died a horrible death that we may have eternal life with you in heaven, Father. We pray this in your son's name, in Jesus Christ.
once again. Dear Father in heaven, we would ask you to bless this cup, this fruit of the vine, which represents the blood which you, that your son shed on the cross, that we may have an eternal life with you in heaven, Father. We pray this in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. remains available for any that did not have an opportunity to lay by in store this morning. <laughs> 